Rotation selection rules for vector operators are married to group theory by Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. Welcome back everyone. Today we'll explore an example that applies these coefficients along with various selection rules, setting the stage for our future discussions on quantum dynamics. Let's get started. Here we see an experimental verification of the position-dependent angular momentum selection rules for absorption of twisted light by a bounded electron. Fun stuff here. The paper will be linked below because this is a great application of it. But for problem 6.25, what we have to do is to express the expectation value of the dipole moment, PE, for an electron in the hydrogen state. Of course, this is the electron dipole moment or the electric dipole moment, not to be confused with another dipole moment that is famous. And the mixed state is psi, which is composed of 211 and psi of 200. Now this is important because we had a typo in the book, so be aware that the errata tells us uh, that this was a typo, and the errata will of course be posted. But with this, what we want to do is, in terms of a single reduced matrix element, and evaluate the expectation value. Note, this is the expectation value of a vector, so you need to compute all three components. Don't forget Laporte's rule. Okay, so that should tell you that we're going to have a very big um, rule base to pull from if we're referencing what we did with this rule back a couple questions ago. Of course, why do we quit? Why do we care? Well, quantum dynamics is going to need these rules. Think about absorption and emission and the spectra that come with those. Definitely going to need them. So that being said, let's give a challenge to everybody about, well, we keep dealing with the electric dipole moment, but what about the electron magnetic dipole moment, which has been a recent discovery uh, compared to the electric dipole moment? And it definitely is a big thing in terms of quantum theory. So definitely keep that around. Even Feynman was talking about the magnetic dipole moment. So definitely look, definitely worth looking into. That being said, this problem has a lot of moving parts. So don't forget about the PDF. Access it using the link below and you'll be good to go. And of course, if you find value in this content, you can have a direct impact on its success by liking, subscribing, sharing with a friend, or donating through buy me a coffee, no account required. So without further ado, let's dive into this question. Awesome. So in stop one then, what we have to do is just set the stage, so to speak. And of course, with the expectation value, we've seen this set up before with the states here. Just put it in and we see now that with the mixed state of the corrected non-typo state that he wanted, Let's go ahead and simplify this down by distributing and seeing what we actually have to deal with. All right, so after the distribution of state with the bra and cats, we're good to go there. No big deal, really. Just a little bit of bookkeeping. Uh, but with this, once we distribute it, we see that we are canceling things out here because of Laporte's rule. And so from this, we see it's quick to see that the two matrix elements are zero via Laporte's rule. Of course, this being the definition of matrix element, which this fits. And thus, we're able to apply equation 6.26, which we uh, set up in problem 6.13. I thought that was very cool to see it come back together. So of course, after getting rid of those two by the selection rule of Laporte, we can go ahead and simplify this with just these two matrix elements. Much better than four. And each each one of these four have three e, three components each because of PE. So imagine having to do four times three. That's 12 uh, sets of integrals, each one with three. Yeah, no thanks. So nonetheless, let's use our uh, conjugate method again to write this as a real part. The one half and two cancel, and we're just left with the real part of this expectation value. And of course, this is all a nice simplification, but the real part here will mean something later. So just keep a mental tab that keeping the RE does have uh, an effect in this problem.
All right, so then this heads us straight to stop number two, which tells us about how we need to apply the operator. And of course, this is a vector operator, and I really, really don't like this notation in the book right now because hats represent operators, not unit vectors. So let's just go ahead and put that the vector operator for R is just the position vector itself, which is defined as XI, YJ, and ZK. Of course, no big deal there once you see it written out, but it definitely can become annoying and confusing when you see R hat and you're just like, wait a second, how is this a unit vector? It's not, these are operators. Griffiths has made this apparent in the beginning of the book, but it sometimes catches you off guard as you're working through this. Uh, but nonetheless, when we apply these in, understanding that I, J, K are unit vectors, we can go ahead and plug them in. Okay, cool. So by doing so, um, we can find the expectation value, but we have to distribute amongst each direction. And when we distribute amongst each direction, what we're left with is X, Y, Z, of course, okay, with the states 211 and 200. But clearly here we cancel it out, but why? Well, what we did was apply equation 6.54, or 6.57, excuse me, which tells us that the um, matrix element has to be zero if uh, M prime doesn't equal M. And this is easy because one, does not equal zero. These two things do not equal. So since they don't equal, this has to be zero and thus we can get rid of it. That's easy enough to deal with. But now that we got rid of that, how do we deal with X and Y? And this leads us to stop number three, which is what we're doing now, which is rewriting X and Y in terms of the raising and lowering operator system, which is what we've seen in chapter three or chapter two, three, four rising up with all the other operator systems like this. Um, so clearly, once again, we see that I, the imaginary unit, is a very important part in this uh, quantum theory. And this, you know, again, the analytic continuation that you can see from this stuff is very fascinating. Um, nonetheless, we're good to go here. But why do we want to do this? Well, it's so that we can invoke the equations that we showed in problem 6.22 which is in reference to raising and lowering operators. So this is a, you know, this theme of raising and lowering with this setup, very important for us. Again, referencing that Z is the angle or the direction, the variable of reference here. So keep that in mind whenever you're doing this. Again, other books use this tensor notation with indices. And that's not always the easiest to follow. But much like in the rest of complex analysis, if I want to solve for the real part, I just add the two operators together, and you see that I, Y, and negative I, Y cancel. Cool. We like that. And then minus them if you want to solve for Y, because then the negative distributes to X. So X and X cancel, and the negative and negative here cancel. So we're left with a positive I there. And then divide over the duplicates, so you see X and Y. Uh, that should have been a Y, I don't know why. Um, it did not roll over. That should be a Y equals. Oops, sorry. Uh, but with that, you know, we have X and Y here. So let's go ahead and put these into the next part and simplify. All right, cool. So now that we have X and Y in terms of raising and lowering, let's plug these in and simplify. Uh, noticing here that the one half can be taken out front because it's a scalar and then also noticing the linearity of the brackets We can split this up into two parts But in doing so let's realize here that we have an R plus and an R minus R plus R minus with the coefficients here Really no big deal here, but how do we know that these elements cancel as indicated with the dashed line? well this calls upon equation 6.58 and with this what we need to do is to be careful because this one's a little more um, of a messy uh, selection rule to follow and because this only applies to the lowering operator and the condition here is that we have one that m prime needs to equal m uh, m minus one excuse me so m prime here is one m is zero so Clearly, M, oh, let me 
go back and erase that. Uh, clearly here what we see is that m, which is 1, does not equal 0 minus 1, which is equal to negative 1. These two things don't equal, so this tells us that that matrix element has to be 0. Cool. If we reference the other condition here uh, for the addition operators, or the uh, raising operators, excuse me, we see here that the only condition that's needed is that instead of a minus sign, we have a plus sign. And here we see that, again, m prime is equal to 1, and that does equal 0 plus 1. So we can't say anything about these matrix elements here, so we just leave them alone. And it's up to us to determine what to do with these matrix elements now that we've simplified. So let's go ahead and simplify this down even more. Pull the 1 half out front just to get rid of it. And then we see that we have a bracket of 2, 1, 1 with the raising and 2, 0, 0 for both terms. So we fact, right factor that out as we see here. And then we're left with just the unit directions here. So I and J, but we have a 1 over, uh, 1 over I thanks to the uh, construction of the raising lowering operator for Y. And so we can simplify this down a little bit more and move on to the next part. Awesome. So clearly then after applying yet again another set of selection rules, we've already been through what, two of them? Laporte and um, equation uh, 6.58, something like that. Um, so clearly we can use a lot of rules to start canceling these things out, which is a, a lot more beneficial than what we first thought we would ever need. And more or less doing this allows us to uh, simplify down without having to do a whole lot of tedious calculation. This stuff is annoying just because it's a lot to get used to. It's a lot of tools to put in your toolbox, but that's a lot easier to find the right tool than it is to do brunt work. Now, of course, uh, we had that one over I here, so we just put that, uh, we ra rationalize that denominator, which flips the sign from plus to minus. Cool, no big deal. Um, but also, we saw that we were left with one uh, angle bracket with this 2, 1, 1 state and 2, 0, 0 state. That is not the reduced matrix form. This in the first line is the reduced matrix form, which is governed by equation 6.59 which we see here. And when we see this, it's a lot of weirdness looking around where the uh, magnitude here is just the reduced matrix element. What we need to be careful of is that these are the, um, these are the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. And if you remember, this was done back in chapter four. Here's the problem that I was getting really annoyed with in this in this per, uh, particular example is that this typo that the author had may lead people to have different results so verify uh, the table the tensor product table that it gave you in the example problem which was uh, figure 6.8 which we'll see here shortly but for those who didn't remember how this uh, Klebsch Gordon coefficient kind of worked out what we see here is that these two numbers were the totals so to speak Okay, and we see that that's nothing but L prime and M prime. Okay, so what we're going to have to do is look at the column with those two numbers in it. And then here, what we have to do to be careful is change colors. Here is the row that we'll have to look at in order to find a coefficient. So let's see how we can do that in real time. Okay, so you can kind of see my doodles here, but nonetheless. What we saw here that we needed to look for is a 1, 1, okay, on the uh, columns. So what we see here is the 1, 1, not bad. And then on the row, what we needed to do was to see the uh, first two indices there. So that was what, a 0, 1? All right. And thus, what we can conclude is that the intersection of these two is the coefficient. But of course, remember that this was under a square root and the negative sign had to go on the outside of that square root. Okay. And so, you know, this stuff is a little bit tedious to keep track of, but very much needed if we want to um, maneuver with the rest of the theory. So best that we learn a couple bits of it now. That being said, 
If you want to see more about that table, go check out Problem 4.9, where we talked a lot about it in a lot more depth. But nonetheless, that was the quick gateway into showing you how that negative on the outside with the 1 over root 2 simplifies to 1 over root 2, or, you know, or excuse me, the negative square root of 1 half is simplified down to negative 1 over root 2. And this cancels with the root 2 negative that was in the formula, so we can get rid of those. Um, again, the author and several other text online or solution sets that I've seen online, they didn't account for this typo, so this might have varying answers. So be aware of that, but we'll run through with it assuming that this is it and we're good to go. After that, it's just a nice simplification act that we have. And here, like I said earlier in the question, this real part will make a difference because of the I that we had from the raising lowering operators. So once we get those things canceled and we see that we get the reduced matrix element here, we're cool, but now we have to apply the fact that we need the real part only so this gets rid of the J component because that is a complex part. Awesome. And thus we can now move to the point where we're just looking at the expectation value in terms of a single reduced matrix element. This was the goal of the question initially. And now our job is to just evaluate this. So that'll be the last stop in this problem. So let's see how we set this up. All right, so stop number four then gets us to, okay, well, if I'm stuck here with this expectation value of the reduced matrix form, I'm allowed by virtue of the selection rules to choose what is the most convenient. Notice that we have the vector operator here back again, although we tried to weed out X, Y, and Z from it, okay? Because of the selection rules and how these things intertwine, I can choose any component of R that is best suited. So why not choose the simplest case? In this case, it would be Z because we know transforming that to a spherical basis is easier that way. That being said, we see here that we can also extend M to whatever is the easiest. So why not the easiest case? And of course, this is zero and zero. So let's make our lives easier because they're all equivalent under the selection rules. So why not maneuver with them? Okay, so here is the written out integral, psi star 210, plug in the conversion from Z to a spherical system, which is R cosine theta. And of course we get phi of 200. And that of course we saw back in equation or problem 4.13 when we solve for these equations initially. So let's go ahead and simplify the integrand here before we maneuver. Noticing that we have a duplicate of 1 over square root of 2 pi a. So that gave us a uh, 2 pi a here. Then we have a 4a squared and a 2a. That gave us 8a cubed. Combining that, we get 8 and 4. That gives us 6, or 8 and 2. That gives us 16. Pi is by itself. We get 1a from the square roots. 4a's or 3a's from this a squared and a. So here, again, all this tedious little cleanup is in the PDF. Here we got to be careful because the cosine comes from the z, not the other wave function. So we still get a cosine squared. We still have two factors of the exponential. And we have one, two uh, r's that need to be distributed into this, cur into this parentheses here. Hence the r squared and r cubed. And now from this we can plug this into the integral equation for this reduced matrix element. And start to solve it. All right, our wonderful friend Fubini allows us to make this quick work, split it up again like we had seen previously, um, and then we see we get 2 pi from phi, 2 thirds from theta, and two replications of the integral table since we have r to the fourth with e and r to the five with e with some constants here. All right, so to clean this up, we clearly see that this constant out front, pi cancels with the pi from the phi, and then we'll leave everything alone. Here we see that the a from this uh, from the function itself in the integrand cancels with one of the a's from the integral table expansion. So that's easy there. Then when we kind of expand this out, seeing that 16 is 4 times 4, and we have an a cubed, 2 times 2 gives us the 4 here. And then we see that the factorials just lead to 4, 3, 2, and then 5 leads to 5 times 4 times 2 times 2 times 1. 
and then we see we have eight to the fifth here after this cancellation no big deal i color coordinate it what things cancel with what as you see this four cancel with this four and you see this three cancel with the common factor of threes in the bracket cool we also see that we have a four eight eight four times eight to the fourth power in this denominator here and you have a common factor here with the four and four then you have an a to the fifth here and an a to the fifth there so they cancel out with four of those five exponents so we're good to go there a whole lot of mumbo jumbo here so to clean up and summarize what we're left with after cancellation is two times one times a minus five times one times a awesome and then we see here that uh this simplifies to 2a minus 5a which gives us the negative 3a once we plug this into the reduced matrix element as a whole not just as the um not just as or when we plug this in for the reduced matrix element to find the expectation value as a whole we see that we get some more cancellations and thus a final 3ea over 2 not too bad we, we got through it pretty quickly once we got the rules started figuring out but understand that you're going to use multiple of these rules as you go through these problems so it's best just to keep a cheat sheet of them uh like i said in the pdfs you'll notice that i always start with relevant or useful equations because guess what they keep popping up and trying to memorize these is hogwash it's not worth it just know where to reference them and you'll be better off and uh, yeah, that was a fun problem. Slightly annoying with the typo, but we got through it. So in summary, we saw how the Klebsch-Gordon coefficient started to become a factor again, as you remember from the addition of angular momenta. And in the fact that that is applied group theory and all the other stuff, clearly, although this book is not going to make reference to it a lot, it will come back again and every other aspect of quantum theory maybe not the coefficients themselves but the concept of angular momentum group theory and everything around that mathematics will be used again so i'm glad to see uh more examples of it that way we're better prepared now there's tons of charts online with these coefficients so you might have better luck with some of them but i'm still fascinated by them i saw the original write-up in uh balm's book from i think 1957 I'm not really sure I'll have to check my footnotes, but it was really cool to see how they came up and recursion relations, tensor products, all that fun stuff that we see later, um, especially when we get to tensors that uh, we see in the um, standard model. Definitely worth investigating and learning those. But nonetheless, all this work is only possible thanks to the supporters of this channel and to you, I wish a very big thank you and a big hug because I'm very grateful for your faith and support. Uh, this is still a, you know, still a work in progress and we're setting the foundations early so that way we can build up to something big and that will take time. So I really do appreciate everything. Um, and, you know, for those who are more interested in some of the other stuff, you couldn't become a patron yourself where and that would allow you to see all the supplemental material some of the higher star questions in this book some of the random things i'll just find online that i think is valuable and so this will also give you access to current and future projects and the one-on-one -on -one help that will seemingly be increasing uh it's already increasing now in the summer with summer classes so definitely check that out new content is posted weekly which is turning out to be more and more of a lie as i get more and more excited about this stuff it's mainly daily now books notes and other reference materials are found below if you have any questions please feel free to reach out and as always thank you for watching until next time stay curious